of the AQFP of the, so welcome to our, today's edition of the AQFP seminar. Um, it's a great pleasure to have Malik Abdesalam as a speaker. Um, Malik studied at Ecole Polytechnique in Palaiso, close to Paris, and did his PhD with Vincent Rivasso, of course, on constructive quantum field theory. And he then did a postdoc at uh, the University of British Columbia in Vancouver with uh, Joel Feldman, David Bridges. And uh, after some time further at, at Paris in a permanent position, he then moved to the University of uh, Virginia at Charlottesville, where he has been since. And uh, Malik is, uh, I think one can say, one of the leading experts on constructive field theory uh, of the younger generation. And um, he is also uh, an expert in combinatorics. And I think uh, you have also done some work on uh, algebraic geometry, as far as I remember. So we're very happy to have you here with a topic that, we, that um, makes uh, relates ADS-CFT to a hierarchical model on a tree. Please. Uh, all right. Um, well, welcome everybody, and uh, thank you, Manfred, for the kind introduction. And uh, also, of course, uh, thank you to the organizers for the uh, invitation to this uh, seminar uh, and uh, <coughs> the opportunity to give this talk. So, the talk is about exploring formal invariance with hierarchical models. Um, so it's basically in two parts. Uh, first, I'm going to give a little bit of context. So the first part, I'll go a little bit quick. Uh, and then I will really start talking about these uh, hierarchical models. Some of you probably uh, may not be familiar with that, so uh, I will try to go a bit slower. And uh, at the very end, I will talk about the, my own work and, and some results. But uh, even if I don't get there, that's, I think that's not uh, a bad thing. So uh, let's start. Okay, so, <clears throat> yes. Um, all right, so the, this is a slide to uh, just mention <clears throat> some context and uh, what's been accomplished uh, in conformal field theory, and that's basically in two dimensions, uh, which is a success story. Uh, of course, the, there is the uh, conformal field theory uh, of the easing model. Uh, so uh, what has been done is the construction of the conformal field theory from the microscopic description uh, the way you describe the, uh, the uh, easing model to uh, kids in uh, primary school, basically. And then, okay, you take a scaling limit at a critical temperature, and then you prove that uh, you have conformal invariance. So this is due to uh, work by these people, Smirnov, Dubeda, Shelka, Koger, Izyorov. Of course, I'm uh, forgetting lots of people who contributed, so please forgive me if I uh, didn't put your name. Uh, I only have one slide for this. So um, uh, another thing which deserves uh, to be mentioned in relation to the easing model is uh, uh, what happens if you uh, uh, perturb a little bit the uh, integrable case by adding next to nearest neighbor uh, interactions. Uh, well, there is work by the uh, Italian school, um, around, uh, Alessandro Giuliani and Mastro, Mastro Pietro, uh, which managed to uh, deal with that and prove that we get the same as with the uh, integrable easing model. Uh, there is also the Liouville CFT, uh, work of Duplanquier, Sheffield, David, Kupianen, uh, Rhodes, Vargas. I think you, you saw a previous seminar by uh, Vincent Vargas who talked about that. Uh, so great, great stuff there. Uh, there is also more exotic mo models, um, uh, for instance, based on multiple SLE paths. And uh, okay, so there's work by uh, particular Kitola, Peltola, and again, other, other people. Uh, I put dot, dot, dot here because uh, from uh, just my lack of knowledge, I'm sure I'm forgetting some other results in 2 dc yet, rigorous 2 dc yet. But okay, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the talk here is about trying to understand going in the direction of trying to understand conformal field theory in dimension at least three. Uh, so I will only uh, talk uh, in Euclidean signature, so Euclidean uh, context of Euclidean quantum field theory. Uh, after all, this is uh, AF uh, uh, analysis, quantum field and probability. So probability setting is closer to that. 
Um, and I will also uh, then introduce these uh, hierarchical models, which are simplified toy models where, uh, I mean, I hope that we, we can gain some insights uh, that help in the real case later. Uh, question? No? All right, so uh, just to recall a few facts. Um, so in dimension at least three, by a result of uh, uh, UV, the only conformal maps that we have are so-called global conformal maps. And so they form a group, uh, the Mobius group. Uh, and, so, uh, and so this is on RD. So how, so let me remind you the, what, what, how one can define this. Uh, you add to RD uh, a point at infinity. So basically uh, you can identify this as a, so this is a one point compactification, but it's basically the same as a sphere using the usual stereographic projection. Okay, uh, so now what is the Mobius group? Well, it's, um, you look at all bijective transformations of this uh, sphere uh, generated by isometries, dilations, and you need to throw in at least some, somebody which moves the point at infinity. For example, the unit sphere inversion defined like this. Uh, this is notation for the Euclidean norm. Uh, so the, this exchanges the point zero and the point uh, at infinity. Uh, now, a completely equivalent definition, probably not as well known uh, <clears throat> for this Mobius group, is basically the uh, invariance group of something called the absolute cross ratio. Uh, so, uh, when you have four distinct points in RD, uh, you take this ratio made out of the uh, Euclidean distances. And in fact, you can extend this to quadruples of points which are distinct and in this, uh, com uh, com I mean, uh, completed RD. Uh, that's because, well, for example, if it's uh, only one of them can be infinite, let's say x4, and then there is this factor and that factor, when you plug uh, x4 equal infinity, basically it's just, uh, they disappear. Okay. Uh, so it's an extension by continuity. And so you look at all bijections of this completed RD to itself, which preserve this cross ratio, and it's exactly the same. Okay. All right. Uh, not, now let me talk a little bit about ADS-CFT. Uh, I said touristic, so paraphrasing Lincoln, this is a, a, a presentation by a tourist for tourists. So please forgive me if you're an expert in the, uh, in the area. So, um, okay, the, there is something called the conformal um, model. Uh, so in that case, so it's a kind of a particular realization of uh, this uh, as a Riemannian space, a symmetric space. So the, the RD with a point at infinity, which is basically a sphere, uh, a d-dimensional sphere can be seen as the boundary of a ball of dimension d plus one. So the unit ball of dimension d plus one. Uh, and you put on this ball the, the following metric, okay? So um, uh, which blows up when the, so X here is a vector in uh, with d plus one components and this blows up as you approach the boundary. So it's like the Poincaré disk. Uh, likewise, there is another way to visualize this using the so-called half space model. Uh, so in that case, RD is seen as the boundary of a half space. So where you have a, an extra coordinate, which is between zero and infinity, and the metric is, uh, is given by this formula. Okay. Um, there's also other models well stated. Now, a very interesting uh, fact is the, um, and it, which I think uh, is really fundamental if you're going to talk about the CFT is that there is a bijection between conformal maps of the boundary, so the, these Mobius transformations, and uh, isometries of the uh, interior of this, um, uh, this ball. Uh, so the, 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 the metric which is put here or, or here if you want, uh, it's a hyperbolic metric, constant uh, negative curvature, and uh, so it's a Riemannian space. And um, <clears throat> so there's a notion of uh, isometries of that Riemannian space. And uh, uh, so these isometries are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the conformal maps. So uh, physicists uh, would call this uh, the bulk or the uh, ADS space, but in Euclidean signature. So Euclidean here is a bit uh, a treacherous word because it's hyperbolic, it's not Euclidean, but it's Euclidean as opposed to Minkowski quantum field. So, uh, so SOD plus one, one instead of SOD two. Uh, 
Um, and so the correspondence is very simple, is you just extend the maps uh, in the ball to the boundary by continuity. And it preserves the boundary, and so it gives you your conformal. OK. Uh, now, in, quantum, in conformal field theory, let's say when we're talking about scalar, primary scalar fields of a certain scaling dimension delta, um, showing uh, that you're dealing with a conformal field theory means that your endpoint functions with the correlation to a field satisfy this transformation rule, uh, where F here is basically a conformal map. Um, so this uh, is just a notation for the Jacobian of the map at X. Uh, what you want to put here is basically a, a local dilation factor, so a local rescaling factor by how much you dilate where you are by this map. Uh, so the way to define it is to take the um, determinant of the Jacobian, that's how volume changes, but then you take the D root for that. Okay, uh, and now, uh, so this local rescaling factor comes uh, at the power delta, and this is characteristic of the CFT you're talking about. So um, this famous ADS-CFT correspondence uh, was discovered by Marc Desena in 1997. And uh, okay, it's a very important area in theoretical physics. And essentially, what it says is that uh, if you look at the, so this is the on the CFT side, this is the generating function of uh, uh, of correlation function. So J is a test function, a source term, or is your operator, I mean your CFT field. Okay, so this is basically a, a function of J, and it's a generating function for these correlations. Well, the, uh, the correspondence says that, well, uh, this should be equal. So here it's in a certain limit, the so-called semi-classical limit, um, but it should be essentially equal to exponential minus uh, S of phi X. So S is a certain here classical action on the, on the D plus one dimensional space, ADS space. Phi X is a um, field on the ADS space. This, so it depends on D plus one coordinates. Uh, which makes this action extremal with a certain boundary condition. And this is where the, uh, the, the J, I mean, it should play a role. It plays a role through this boundary condition, uh, which is indicated here as you go close to the boundary. So this is uh, the, um, uh, in the uh, half space model where this, uh, this is the uh, holographic uh, coordinate. Okay. Um, so uh, physicists, I mean, what is mysterious is what is this um, action? What, what is this uh, uh, classical or quantum field theory or even string theory in the bulk uh, that allows this correspondence? So uh, in physics, um, uh, people have been toying with several uh, models I and mean, several actions. So for example, right, so it's in curved space, you, you start with a kinetic term, uh, some mass term, and you can put the other things there, of course. Um, in fact, the uh, delta, the scaling dimension of the CFT is related to this mass, uh, and uh, which can actually be negative, but not too much, there is a certain bound. Uh, it needs to be satisfied, but okay, you can um, do, uh, you know, Feynman diagrams, uh, ex perturbation expansion. So the Feynman diagrams for this kind of thing is, uh, they're called Witten diagrams. Uh, and for example, if you look at the simplest uh, so-called Mercedes logo uh, three-point diagram, so you have three points on the boundary, uh, on the, uh, and you have one point in the bulk which is integrated, and it's uh, related to these three points. Um, <clears throat> so when you do the computation, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a nice exercise. You find exactly this, and this is exactly the kind of formula expected from conformal invariant. For the three point function of the CFT. Okay, uh, so if you've never seen any of this, let me give you a concrete example that should help, I think, uh, follow. Uh, so, kind of trivial example the free CFT. Uh, so, uh, take a Borel probability measure on S prime of RD, uh, which is a Gaussian centered measure uh, with this particular covariance. Uh, so you see here, I put the scaling dimension delta, which for me is a parameter. Uh, so that um, corresponds to a path integral, if you want, uh, where the action has this form. So it's basically, uh, the, it involves uh, uh, 
the uh, fractional Laplacian at a certain power alpha. Alpha is exactly given by d over two minus delta. And I will only talk about this particular um, uh, range for delta because it tells me that my, um, I mean, this is locally integrable in momentum space and the uh, correlation functions are also locally integrable. If you want the moments, which normally have distributions on n copies of Rd, uh, which typically are singular on the, when you have coinciding points, well, these are actually L1 log and given by integrating honest, honest functions on the complement of the diagonal. And in this case is what you know. So uh, the two point function is some constant kappa over the distance of power to delta. Uh, the four point function is given by summing over pairings. And of course, higher uh, are also given by higher correlations are given by summing over pairings. Okay, so the so-called Iseris Vic formula. Now, uh, I would like to make a remark, uh, for, uh, two remarks. The first one is that uh, this uh, example is actually unitary and satisfies Hostovaud the Schrader positivity. It's not probably super well known, but uh, at least when you impose delta, at least, I mean, when you impose delta bigger than d minus two over two. Uh, so we already have a class of examples. If you, uh, uh, so if you take delta between d minus two over two and d over two, d is at least three. Okay. Uh, moreover, a second remark is that this example, I mean, from the point of view of constructive field theory and <laughs> axiomatic, I mean, it's trivial. There is nothing to do. Okay. Uh, no renormalization, no nothing. So, of course, it's trivial. But from the point of view of the conformal bootstrap, it is not trivial. Um, I mean, the reason for that is that if you do the conformal bootstrap, then you have Expansions with conformal blocks, it's the same conformal blocks that you have here that you would have, for instance, in a 3D easing CFT, right? because these are kinematic uh, objects. So, and actually, there is work by uh, uh, Kravchuk and uh, Simmons Dutton, for example, where they explore this uh, to death. Uh, so, um, and also from the ADS CFT correspondence, it's also non trivial. You might want to ask, what is the bug dual uh, to this uh, CFT? That's an interesting question. <laughs> It's not, it's not uh, easy. Actually, maybe one can prove something rigorously uh, about this. There is a paper by D Douglas uh, Mazzucato and um, Razamat, uh, if I pronounce correctly. Uh, but it's theoretical. OK, now uh, I think every talk should have at least the proof. So here is the proof. I'm going to prove to you that this is indeed conformally invariant by global conformal transformations. So I have to show this identity. Um, and so, because of the formula for the correlation, it reduces to the n equal two case, uh, which is powers of the distance between the points. Uh, when f is a Euclidean isometry, this is one, uh, and this is completely trivial uh, because the distance, it's, it's in terms of the distances between the points. Um, if it's a dilation, it's also easy to check that it's uh, just by homogeneity that uh, the power that comes out here uh, is compensated by this. Uh, so there is only one case to check, which is the um, inversion with respect to the unit sphere. OK, you do the computation. This is the Jacobian uh, matrix uh, at x. Uh, so the rescaling factor, when you compute the determinant, just gives you um, x to the power minus 2, the, I mean, the norm, not really the norm of x. And at the end of the day, this just amounts to a completely elementary identity, which you can uh, check in, in one line, two lines, uh, which is this. All right, so that's a proof. <laughs> Uh, good. Uh, so now the good news is that uh, everything I mentioned uh, makes sense over these so-called hierarchical models. Uh, so there's a p-adic analog. Uh, well, I mean, in particular, this, the p-adic formulation of the uh, uh, <coughs> of hierarchical models. Uh, and there is all this work by pre uh, previous authors, Melzer, who introduced uh, conformal field theory in, in this setting, uh, also worked by Lerner and Misarov. Uh, more recently, uh, the late uh, Steve Gupser and many students and postdocs now continue working on this. There's quite a bit of literature actually. Um, uh, essentially formulated what, what is the theatic analog of uh, the ADS CFT correspondence, etc. etc. Um, in this work, for example, they do computations for the um, uh, ON, I mean the ON model, I mean the end the n component by four model, uh, I think in three dimensions, uh, non-rigorous, of course. If you look at their computations, for example, for the 
for the phi square scaling dimension um, in the hierarchical case, which is also what they, they were looking at. Um, this actually has been proved uh, um, by myself as well as um, AJ Chandra and Gianluca Guadagni. Uh, all right. Okay, now uh, really the start of my talk. So what is this apiatic uh, uh, or hierarchical uh, business? Okay, so take a, a P, a fixed integer, at least two. Uh, so if you look at the cubes of size P to the K, so uh, K can be any uh, integer positive or negative. Um, so um, yeah, you, you look at the basically a partition of RD by um, cubes of that size which are uh, basically sitting, um, which are centered uh, around uh, lattice points where the mesh is P to the K, right? Uh, so I'm using uh, centered. Um, <clears throat> you could also put things on the corner, but it's very thick centered. So uh, for fixed K, these cubes form a partition of RD. Now, if you put all the, the scales together, uh, then these cubes are either uh, disjoint or uh, one contained into the other. So they have this nested structure. Okay. But for this, you need P to be up. <laughs> Easy exercise. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so let me call T the set of all these cubes. So the set of all these cubes, it has the structure of a uh, doubly infinite tree which is organized in what you might call layers. That's why I used L uh, at the, to correspond to scales. So, okay, now I, I'm gonna show you a picture to help you uh, follow, but uh, I'm gonna ask you to forget about RD, about cubes inside RD, and just remember the tree structure, okay? Um, the tree structure then doesn't really care about P being um, uh, even or odd. And in fact, for our work, we, there is a secret hypothesis, not, not absolutely necessary, but it's mostly for aesthetic reason uh, and relate, relating to theatics uh, is basically we restrict to P a prime number. All right, so this is kind of the picture. So this is like the uh, L0 is like the unit cubes, uh, L minus one, the cubes of size, linear size one over P. Uh, Etc. Uh, the other direction, so L2, the, this is a cube of size P squared, etc. Uh, so this is the picture for P equal 2 and D equal 1. Uh, in general, uh, if you have um, a vertex in the tree, it would have P to the D uh, uh, children. Okay. So this is how it looks like. And you can see, uh, so, and this is infinite in both directions. So uh, I introduced this funny notation for the set of leaves at infinity, because we have to imagine you can go all the way to infinity and where you end is a point of this thing called L minus infinity. There is also another point which you don't see here. If you go all the way down, okay, there is a point at infinity uh, all the way down. Okay, so let me define now the uh, hierarchical continuum. So this is, if you know PADX, this is exactly what you know. If you don't, it's okay. This is a, a notation. I'm defining, oops, uh, I'm defining what this is by the set of leaves at, at infinity. More precisely, uh, what's a leaf at infinity is basically a bi-infinite path like this one in red okay. um, <coughs> in, this, in this tree. Uh, now, uh, the, tree the, the tree that you see here is actually a metric space, and it's kind of a prototype for what the hyperbolic space is. It's kind of the simplest uh, hyperbolic space uh, because you can uh, put on it the uh, so-called graph distance. The distance between two points in the tree is how many edges to go from one to the other. Okay. Uh, and it really behaves like a hyperbolic uh, space. Okay, um, so, uh, okay, there is a little funny labeling here. Um, so, um, a, a point, a leaf at infinity x, uh, precisely is basically a, a, a sequence, a sequence of what? A sequence of, uh, okay, what, what is the next choice you make uh, as you go from the bottom to the top? It's just that the, I labeled uh, the, the choices A0, A1, in kind of a funny numbering with respect to how. Label the uh, 
the layers, but okay. Uh, but here each, so the A0 tells you how you choose a cube of size one over P in a cube of size uh, one. It's the same as basically uh, picking some, uh, some element of this finite set with P to the D element. Okay, uh, another funny thing, uh, again, it's because if you know the P addicts, then it's exactly what you learn. If not, okay, uh, it's a def uh, It's how do you rescale such an object by powers of P? So uh, you multiply or you divide by P, what happens? Well, uh, so I, I need to pick a, um, so there, there is a um, distinguished element here. So uh, where all these digits are made of zeros, if you want. You can think of it as the, the branch in the tree, which is always to the left, to the left, to the left, to the left. Call that the origin. And now if you have another um, uh, uh, element leaf at infinity x, well, uh, uh, if you go down far enough, it coincides with this thing. And then so, uh, and then all of a sudden, poof, it branches. Uh, what happens now um, if you, so what, multiplication by p by definition is just an upward shift by one one level okay uh, in terms of the sequence of choices of digits it's basically just shifting the sequence uh, likewise uh, p minus one x by definition is the opposite so you shift down by one step okay um, <clears throat> all right uh, now there is a notion of distance so um, if you take two leaves at infinity x and y, uh, which are distinct, uh, then th they must merge somewhere. If you go all the way, all the way down, so you just keep track of uh, at which level does the merging occur. Uh, remember L to the k is like cubes of size p to the k, and so by definition, the distance between x and y is p to the k. Yeah. So the higher the merging, the closer they are. The lower the merging, the further they are. And this distance, by definition, is always a power of p and also zero. If uh, here, okay, what is this difference? Is is just a notation for the distance between x and y. Again, if you know p addicts, it's you take the difference, which makes sense. And, uh, so um, keep in mind that with my definition of how you rescale, how you multiply somebody by p, whatever that means, I mean this shift. Uh, if you multiply x and also y, what happens to the distance? Well, so very important to keep in mind, it, it, uh, it is divided by p instead of being multiplied by p. So, okay, <laughs> just weird convention. Um, now, uh, so we have now a metric uh, space structure on the set of leaves at infinity. Uh, <clears throat> There is uh, so there is a notion of closed balls, and in fact, the closed balls for this uh, metric, which is actually an outer metric, so uh, the, the distance, I mean, the triangle inequality is not less than the sum; it's less than the max of the. Okay, so it's a stronger um, triangle inequality. Uh, so the uh, the closed balls are all nested, uh, and uh, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between closed balls and points in the tree in the box. Okay, so if you have a point in the tree here, uh, that's basically in bijection with a box, which I call delta. Uh, so uh, that's basically all leaves obtained by paths where you come, you go through there, and then you go wherever you want. Does that make sense? Uh, please interrupt. Uh, I mean, uh, I think there's no point in <laughs> keeping talking about this if you're lost at some point. But so uh, please interrupt me if uh, you have any questions. Yeah, no. Okay. Okay, so this, um, this uh, space of leaves at infinity Q, which I denote by QP to the D, so it's a metric space. So it has a Borel sigma algebra and it has a kind of natural uh, measure, uh, which is the analog of the Lebesgue measure. Uh, <coughs> In terms of the addicts, it is actually the, uh, a, an additive harm measure. And uh, the way you define it is very elementary. Uh, I mean, basically, um, let me oops, go back up. Uh, so um, <clears throat> each one of these boxes of size one has volume zero, uh, volume one. 
And then uh, this one with that volume, uh, one over p to the d, etc. So uh, <coughs> it's basically like the flipping coins, and then you repeat that in every box size one. Uh, but the important thing is that uh, the structure, the tree kind of looks one, I mean, the, the set of leaves kind of looks one dimensional. So where is the dimension here? The dimension is as usual in the, uh, how the volume of a, of a ball uh, scales in terms of the radius of the ball and it's e to the d times, uh, uh, um, e to the d times k if the radius is p to the k. Um, there is something which is called the hierarchical unit lattice. Uh, it would be basically um, looking just at the layer uh, L0. Uh, so you have now a discrete is like Z, ZD, if you want. And uh, okay, the, the distance now uh, between lattice sites would, you can define it this way by taking in phi moves over. Um, <clears throat> so this is actually what is the setting used typically in statistical mechanics when you talk about the hierarchical model and since the work of Dyson um, in the 60s on the long range easing model in one dimension. All right. Uh, so, what is the massless Gaussian measure? Um, so, here is how you, you can construct it. So, for, um, uh, for every vertex in the tree, you look at the children of that vertex. So, there is P to the D of them. And so what you do is you throw in uh, uh, some uh, n01 independent variables, for one for each. And then you come and by decree, you condition, you impose that uh, the sum of the random uh, of these uh, n01s, now they're gonna, be, uh, the sum is gonna be zero, okay? Or, or in other words, uh, what you have here is a Gaussian vector uh, with p to the d components. Uh, if you uh, centered and the covariance matrix basically has, um, okay, let me get it right. Yeah, one minus P to the minus D on the diagonal and everywhere uh, away from the diagonal, you have minus P to the minus D. Notice the minus is because things become negatively correlated because you impose that they add up to zero. Does that make sense? So you put this for every uh, group of children of anybody in the tree. And uh, between group, uh, they, they're independent. So now you have a random field, uh, a Gaussian random field on the tree with a little bit of correlation because of this conditioning. Okay. So almost surely we have this property. So zeta x is the variable sitting at x. Okay, uh, there is clearly a notion of uh, ancestor. Uh, so if you have a um, uh, uh, two points in the tree. Uh, there is a clear notion of who's the ancestor. Uh, if you have a point, a leaf at infinity and a point uh, um, and a level below, there is notion of who is the ancestor of the point at infinity. So this is just a notation. And so using this, I'm going to tell you wh uh, the, what is the uh, the Gaussian, the analog of the previous uh, massless Gaussian measure. Uh, so the massless Gaussian field. Uh, indexed by uh, these leaves at infinity is given by a geometric series where you sum over all the ancestors. So you look at the path that takes you to the leaf X. Uh, you collect all the random variables sitting along the path and you sum them up with a geometric weight. And this is where the uh, scaling dimension comes in. So this is a parameter. And so, okay, if you look at the two point function, at least formally, what you find is a constant time uh, divided by this distance. So, this is the distance, uh, the, arc, the, the article distance that you find. Um, now, okay, uh, geometric series usually only converge in one direction. You can sum a geometric series over Z. So, there is a little, uh, okay, there is a little swindle here. And it has to do with the fact that this is um, not a uh, true function, a random function, it is a random distribution. Okay, so I have to define what is the random distribution. And so here okay, I'm dropping the, the P symbol from the distance, but it's the hierarchical distance I'm talking about. Okay, so what is a test function? A test function by definition is a function which is smooth and locally constant. Uh, so uh, the space is totally disconnected so that there are non-trivial functions like that, there's lots. Um, so let's call this uh, uh, space of test function S, like short space. 
uh, you put on it the so-called lo finest locally convex topology. Uh, but then once you have that, then you have a dual automatically, the, the topological dual, which is actually the algebraic dual here. You put the strong topology there, which happens to coincide, this is exceptional, with the uh, weak star topology. And uh, okay, so um, if you want maybe a more kind of con concrete uh, topological space that you know, uh, so um, actually the dual is simpler. It's exactly the same as taking a countable product of copies of R with a product topology. And in particular, this is a super nice Polish space, so you can ask uh, what is the weak convergence of probability measures and all that. Um, this one actually is a, a little bit more complicated, but it's basically the, the direct sum of n copies of R, so sequences which eventually become zero. Okay, um, now uh, let's be a bit more concrete. So really, I'm interested in mostly in diamond d equals three. The particular value of the parameter that I like to take is three minus epsilon over four. Uh, we're going to use this. Uh, I'm going to pick a certain power of p. Uh, that's essentially for renormalization group analysis. I'm going to go between uh, scales by p to the l each time instead of uh, just uh, p. So making big jumps. Um, I introduce also two quantities, R and S, uh, which uh, will serve as uh, uh, cutoffs. Um, so, okay, so R is actually the ultraviolet cutoff, meaning that I'm going to uh, impose a cutoff on short distances, which are smaller than P to the R. Same as kind of approximating the continuum by a lattice of mesh P to the R. And so with that, I'm going to define a regularized Gaussian measure. And in that case, it's given by this. So if you remember, it's exactly the same formula as before. Uh, but now this is limited in the negative, meaning in the ultraviolet direction uh, <coughs> uh, by, uh, by essentially R times L. Uh, so um, when you do this, and these are these, uh, these kind of n zero one condition variables that collect along the path. So when you do this, the sample fields for this uh, measure are honest functions from QP to the D into R. Um, and they are locally constants at the control. I know exactly what is the scale of local constancy is L to the R. Okay. Uh, moreover, all these measures, uh, they are scale copies of each other, in particular, the one where the cutoff is at unit scale. Uh, and okay, so if you sample phi uh, using this unit scale measure, you rescale exactly like this, you get the, uh, the cutoff measure CR. Um, just notice that here it's normally you would put minus, but because of the funny uh, way the rescaling by powers of P works, it's a plus. Um, okay, so let me give you a, what is a free CFT in this context. Okay. Um, so um, I will define the non cutoff Gaussian measure. Um, basically, you can define it as the weak limit, in the ordinary sense of the Borel probability measures mu CR, which are um, uh, supported on smooth uh, fields. Uh, so it's an honest measure, but on distributions now, on this hierarchical space. And one can show, I mean, uh, with the particular um, value that I put here uh, for phi is that you, uh, the, uh, so the, the moments, which are distributions in several copies of the QPD, uh, they are locally integrable given by integrating against honest uh, endpoint functions, like physicists like to uh, talk about uh, at non-coinciding points. The two-point function has the same form, except that here, this is the hierarchical distance. X and Y are leaves at infinity, OK? Um, <clears throat> kappa is another constant. And the higher functions are defined by a Vick's theorem. As usual. And so here is a uh, theorem. This is a CFT. OK, but uh, probably <laughs> what you would like to ask is, uh, <laughs> what does a conformal invariance mean here? OK, so. Um, any questions so far? I'm, I'm probably going a little too fast. Please interrupt if you have questions. David, you have to unmute yourself. Hmm, sorry? 
I think David has a question, but he hasn't unmuted himself. Oh, <laughs> David? Um, hi, Malik? Yes. Um, I should have asked this a long time ago, um, but uh, my question is, is it the case that every single isomorphism on the bulk space has a conformal boundary no, band? No, yeah. no. Go ahead. Uh, is it the case that uh, not? Let, let's uh, first ask for um, uh, conformal transfer the CFG transformation when you have um, the continuum, not the hierarchical model. Just for a moment. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it the case that every single isomorphism on the bulk space has boundary values in the sense of the uh, uh, conformal ADS conformal uh, that you you mentioned? Yes, I mean that's you mean the that's the I mean the, ge the geometry I mean it's a theorem in geometry uh, that uh, if you have a hyperbolic uh, uh, isometry. So that, that, that's what you're talking about. Uh, as yes. Mm -hmm. You have a hyperbolic Riemannian space, uh, complete Riemannian space, so this boundary is at infinity, uh, at infinite distance. And so if you have any uh, isomorph, I mean, any isometry, a bijection, mm -hmm. uh, which is you know, the infinity and uh, conserves of the metric, uh, it, you can actually, it has boundary, uh, you can extend it to the boundary. Oh, okay. Thank you. And so that's even more probably easy to do in this hierarchical case. Uh, it's, it's not completely trivial. It's, uh, I'll oh. let, yes, it's, it's nice. Uh, okay. I mean, this is not me. Eh, that's, this has been worked out by geometers. A, a very good reference actually for this kind of stuff is a book by uh, um, John Radcliffe about mm -hmm. you find everything about so, all right, so I need to explain now what is uh, the hierarchical analog of conformal invariance. So first, what is the epiatic uh, Mobius group? So uh, here I'm actually uh, using, um, so this essentially was developed by um, Lerner and Misaro in the early 90s, and that, that was before that was ADS-CFT. So that's quite remarkable. Um, so you start with the, what I call the leaves at infinity, and you add one extra point. Uh, if you remember in the tree picture, where is that extra point? Is the one all the way at the bottom. Okay. <laughs> it's all the way at the bottom. So, okay, so now you have, um, okay, the set of leaves at infinity plus also the leaf all the way down, uh, which I call QPD hat. Now you take all bijections of this, um, um, this bound, I mean, this set. Uh, which, um, I mean, the group of bijections generated by, okay, um, uh, isometries. So, um, of course, you, isometries, you said that they fix the point at infinity, but isometries in the metric space that I talked about, right? So you take those. Um, you take dilations uh, by powers of P, but those sh vertical shifts, okay? Um, and now you need to throw in a unit sphere inversion. So here it is. It's the same formula, but instead of uh, minus two here, you have a uh, two. <laughs> Sorry, that's the, the added, uh, conventions. So here, the size of um, X is basically the automatic distance to this preferred uh, element, which is say, the, the path going all the way to the left, or maybe the right. If you, <laughs> I, maybe I should have a mirror uh, picture. Okay, uh, so that's one definition. And uh, another definition is exactly as before. Um, so you define the cross ratio, but where you use the ultrametric instead of the Euclidean distance, and you ask for bijections which conserve the cross ratio, and it's exactly the same group. Okay, so same thing. And now, the, so this is uh, relative to David's question. Uh, the exact same result, uh, sorry, this is not okay, QPD3, but uh, this is in any dimension. So the exact same result. If you have a, uh, an is isometry of the tree, <coughs> so, <coughs> sorry, for the graph distance, uh, so basically a bijection of the, of the infinite tree as a graph. Uh, so uh, such, an, uh, such a bijection can be extended 
by continuity to the boundary. Uh, so if you have leaf at infinity, you take a point that goes to it. You look at the image by the transformation. Where does it go? It also goes to the boundary, and you use this to define the bijection at the boundary level. And uh, the crucial fact, it is, again, a bijection, one-to-one -one correspondence between so-called conformal uh, maps of the boundary and isometries of the bulk, which is the trick. And uh, so the key for this is this particular lemma, I think, uh, yeah, uh, due to um, Mumford, uh, Manning, and Drinfeld. So if you have four points on the, on the boundary, the cross ratio is given by this formula. Uh, so I don't know if, uh, ah, okay. So you see, if you take two leaves at infinity, there is a unique geodesic right, which is a bi-infinite path where you come down and then go back up, right? And so uh, there is, a, which is the analog of the, you know, the ideal geodesics in the Lobachevsky plane. Um, so uh, you take the one going from X1 to X2, you take the one going from X3 to X4, and so, okay, several things can happen. These paths don't intersect, in which case this cross ratio if they intersect, you just look at the length of the uh, intersection, which is finite, and you take p to that length minus that length. Uh, but you have to count it positively or negatively according to the uh, orientation. So if the orientations agree, you count it positively. If they, if they go like that, uh, uh, you count negative. But that's the key thing that you used to, to show this. It is, uh, it's done in a paper by uh, Lerner and Nissan. Is not my default. So here is um, also how you can define conformal invariance at the level of endpoint functions. Uh, so basically, it's the same formula, uh, exactly the same formula when you transform by the transformation f. But now I have to explain to you what is this uh, uh, rescaling factor. It's not the Jacobian. I don't know how to differentiate these things. But okay, it's uh, very simple. Um, you have your transformation f. You look at how volume is multiplied near where you are. So strictly speaking is you take F inverse, push forward of the Lebesgue measure by that. It turns out to be uh, absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure. You think there are only Nicodem weight. That's the analog of uh, absolute, I mean, absolute value of the Jacobian determinant. And then you take one uh, power one over D, that gives you the local rescaling factor. So M is uh, the, the Lebesgue measure. measure. And so here is the proof of conformal invariance for this particular measure. Uh, so we have to show something. Oh, sorry, uh, I shouldn't have. I mean, this is the. Okay, sorry, I typo. This is the this Radon-Nicodine uh, derivative. Uh, so basically, it uh, because it's Gaussian, it reduces to the n equal two case. Um, now for f and isometry, it's. Trivially equal uh, for a rescaling, you just by homogeneity, you just see that it, it works. You just need to check the case of the inversion. Um, and it turns out that in that case, the rescaling factor is exactly the same, but this is not the Euclidean norm, this is the ultrametric. And uh, at the end of the day, the, the way you prove it is by showing this elementary identity. Which is exactly the same, except that it's the hierarchical inversion and it's the, the hierarchical distance everywhere. Uh, just to um, go back to the tree to tell you what is this, what is, how do you see this uh, inversion? So um, you see, so the if if I follow the tree all the way like that, all the way to the left, okay, this is going towards the origin. The point at infinity is over here. They're going all the way down. What is the unit sphere? Well, you look at uh, this path uh, at level zero, so this point. Basically, everything that comes ex comes out exactly at that level, so basically this uh, kind of part of the set of leaves at infinity, this is the unit sphere. And what this transformation does, it keeps those guys fixed, and essentially it does a kind of rotation uh, around this point. Uh, by 180 degrees. So these guys are going to come down and the stuff over here is going to uh, come all the way up here. Uh, okay. All right. How am I doing for time? 10 minutes? Ooh. Yes, yes. We still have 10 minutes. 
Okay. Good. So this is to try to at least give you an idea of what conformal. I mean, I think that's the main part of my talk. Now, okay, let me try to. Uh, so this is a, a trivial example. It's a Gaussian example, but uh, we do have a uh, um, a serious candidate for a non-trivial uh, theory which satisfies this conformal invariance, and lots has been proved. So this is uh, mainly the work that I mentioned with uh, John Guadagni and E.J. Chandra. Okay, so let's be a bit more precise. Um, so it's a 5-4 type model. Uh, so I start with the uh, Colbert, I mean the, um, uh, the Gaussian measure, the massless Gaussian with a cutoff uh, at scale P to the uh, L to the R. So that's like imposing a, a, a lattice uh, with that mesh. Uh, and I'm going to perturb with the Radon in the usual way, where, okay, this is the what I put in the interact in the potential, uh, which so everything depends on R as usual in normalization. Uh, lambda to the S, this is the box uh, centered at the origin of radius L to the S. So S, uh, so L to the S, this is a huge length. This is the size of my vo big volume, and it's going to plus infinity. Uh, L to the R, I don't know where I wrote it, is going to zero. Um, <clears throat> so I integrate over with a Lobeck measure, um, what you usually put, so phi four, Vic ordered with respect to this covariance, uh, phi squared, with some couplings here, which depend on the cutoff. And the way they depend on the cutoff is very specific. Um, uh, there is a very explicit quantity here. Uh, times a constant for the phi four, and same thing here uh, times the so sorry uh, mu here. <laughs> sorry, mu is used for the measure. This is for the mass. Sorry. Uh, so um, what does this mean? This means that we're in the regime where at the level of the unit lattice, it's the same theory, but we just scale it. So it's a strict scaling limit of a fixed probability measure on the unit lattice. That's, for example, what you do when you try to construct uh, the easing CFT or uh, the KPZ fixed point. Uh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, all right. So, we have now a probability measure on a space of distributions, and uh, I want to prove weak conversions. I mean, we did prove weak conversions. Uh, we proved weak conversions for not just the field itself, but also the square. This is really the, the, the new thing in, in our paper never be done. Uh, there were previous results in your article where essentially they constructed a random field uh, going all the way back to work of Sinai, uh, Blair and Sinai. So, um, <clears throat> okay, so um, let me denote phi RS, the um, random distribution sample with this uh, cutoff measure, interacting measure. Now let me define a renormalized square uh, like this. Okay, so what does that mean? So J here is a test function. I'm trying to define a distribution. So uh, the distribution okay, uh, acts on the test function by integration against what? This thing. So uh, this is the uh, field itself. I take the Vic ordering, uh, which essentially is just a recentering, probabilistically. And uh, so there is a, um, a recentering, but it's the Gaussian recentering. It's not the true recentering. So I need to put another additive correction, which essentially is the true recentering. Uh, and uh, y0, y2 are they're just some constants. Okay, forget about them. On the other hand, this is the really non trivial part is we have a multiplicative renormalization because the field phi squared has a non scaling dim dimension. And we proved that. So we show that uh, if you put the correct number here, uh, <clears throat> then uh, the joint law of the field itself and the square converges uh, when you remove the cutoffs uh, in any order. So the ultraviolet, or you do the infinite volume first, or the ultra, you do it in any order you want. Uh, y1 is just another uh, constant. Uh, now for the theorem, uh, I need a certain um, ingredient, which is basically an approximate um, fixed point. It's a non-trivial fixed point, and it's an approximation to the position of that fixed point given explicitly by that. It's essentially of order epsilon, which is small. So we have two fixed points, the Gaussian and the non-trivial fixed point, but it's close within epsilon. So it's like uh, Wilson's epsilon expansion, but done rigorously. With all. 
So here is the theory. Uh, horrible, I, I know, <laughs> but this is what we proved in 2013. <laughs> Uh, so the uh, okay, uh, what's going on? It just says that basically this the joint law of these two distributions converges weakly. Um, it satisfies. Um, I mean, it's non-Gaussian, so it was worth working for it. Uh, so the, the, this is the uh, fourth cumulant. For um, one, this is just the ball centered. It's, it's some preferred test function. Okay. Uh, the, also, the square field is non-trivial because uh, if you re if you allow yourself a multiplicative renormalization, you can just kill it and make it identically zero almost surely. So okay, it's non-trivial, um, and the uh, it, it, the joint law. I mean, the so the two fields at the same time. Uh, the law is invariant by rescalings, rescalings by uh, powers of L, which itself is a power, a fixed power of P, which is the minimal rescaling amount you can do in this uh, funny setting. But OK, we proved that. Uh, and um, so when you rescale, you, you get um, basically the rescaling factor at a certain uh, scaling dimension. So the scaling dimension of the square is different from twice the, the scaling dimension of the field, which is what you get in the, in the Gaussian case. I think this is the first time we I mean, there was a proof of anomalous scaling dimension uh, using um, a non-trivial uh, Wilson renormalization group type fixed point. Uh, and the reason is, uh, so this number is non-zero. Okay, so this is maybe a better, <laughs> more visual way to see this uh, scaling invariance. Um, also, we proved we have some quantitative estimates on the difference, the anomalous dimension, the square versus two times the dimension of the field, and we find exactly this. So epsilon over three, uh, note that if you take epsilon equal one, that would be kind of like working with uh, a hierarchical uh, five uh, easy model or a five form model, for example, studied by Koch and Witter. Uh, it's kind of funny that if you plug epsilon equal one, you get 0.33, whereas if you take the easing CFT, the, this difference here between the scaling dimension of the energy field versus the field itself is 0 0.37. So a completely silly model <laughs> kind of feels, uh, captures maybe some of that highly non-trivial uh, result from conformal bootstrap. Um, okay, we other things we put, I'm just gonna uh, almost there, uh, done, but let me mention the other results we have. Um, so, uh, we proved that this uh, joint law that you get in the limit for the field and the square is uh, independent of the, the parameter G that, um, <coughs> so this is basically the, the G is the phi four coupling at the unit on the unit lattice the mass has to be adjusted to a critical value, like we do the critical temperature for easing. Uh, but then uh, what happens if you took a different phi-4 coupling on the unit lattice? You'd get another measure. Well, it is exactly the same. So this is actually a universality result. And we prove uh, this is not weak universality. It's strong universality, but local, meaning uh, you have to be close to the fixed point point. Um, and you can also do the same thing if you put some phi six and phi eight and other uh, terms in your point uh, Also, another result uh, by myself, Chandra and Guadani. So, this is not on RT, but it's in AJ Chandra's thesis, chapter four. I mean, it's a joint result, but okay, that's the only place where you can find it <laughs> written uh, for the public. So, um, uh, we showed that this joint measure is fully scale invariant. So instead of uh, invariance by scaling of, by p to the little l, uh, which means you, you make several kind of uh, rescaling minimal rescaling steps at once, here we uh, get go to a bigger scaling group, which is powers of p, which is smaller. And this relies on completely different techniques, uh, essentially correlation inequality. And um, we proved the result, which is close to uh, uh, what um, Eisenman and um, uh, <clears throat> uh, Dominique Copin and uh, Sidora Vicious uh, proved it, meaning that you, you transition directly into long range order. Uh, so uh, that's what we proved. We, did, we were not aware of their result at the time. I mean, 2013, that's what we need to prove that. 
so the correlations, uh, these are two point functions, look like you expect. Of course, the uh, higher are not uh, obvious to write. But so that's the last result is that um, the, um, so this is not on our key, the, the by myself around 2015, uh, I mean, like May 2015. So um, the, uh, if you look at the moments of the joint laws of the field and it's square, so uh, you of arbitrary order, you put as many fees or phi squares as you want. Uh, so psi here is just choosing, well, is it a fee or is it a phi square? So if you look at one of these moments, uh, then it is uh, normally it's a distribution in, in terms of these smearing functions f1, fn, but in this case it is uh, locally integrable, L1 log. Uh, so you really have a uh, um, uh, function at non-coinciding points, which is locally integrable on at coinciding points, uh, such that you integrate and it gives you the uh, the probabilistic moment of a random distribution. Uh, so I proved that. And actually, I have an explicit formula for this, um, which, if you expand completely, gives you a, an expansion in Wooten diagrams, essentially. Uh, um, but uh, there is a problem with these Wooten diagrams. It's not the ones that you would like to, to see. And that's why, actually, we, uh, I haven't yet proved uh, uh, conformal invariance in the your articles. There's more work to be done. Um, so the uh, the previous representation uh, as an integral of correlations, uh, the crucial ingredient is that you have a bound like this on the, on these pointwise correlations of pi and pi squared. Uh, so this is um, okay. I call that basic nearest neighbor factorized bound, and you can learn more about this in uh, my recent article in CMP. Uh, basically, it says that you have. Uh, if you can find the points say, to a compact uh, set, they're distinct, then uh, you have a boundary, you have a constant, and here you have one, it's a product of one over the distance from point zi to the, who the who's the nearest neighbor uh, at the power, which is the scaling dimension of it. So uh, this is the crucial in ingredient. And uh, okay, so I want. Okay. I'll just mention that there is also uh, an explicit expansion. When you write it, you see something which is basically a written diagram. Uh, you see uh, bulk, to prop bulk to boundary with the right propagators, in particular the bulk to boundary propagators, as uh, studied by uh, Gupser and collaborators um, over the PLX. Um, what is wrong is that the, uh, the vertices are kind of anisotropic. Uh, so that, that's what's missing to prove conformal inverse. All right, uh, thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Malet. Let's all unmute and applaud for, to thank him for his talk. Okay, and uh, yes, are there any questions? If you have a question, please just speak up. I don't see everyone on the screen. Well, uh, I have two questions. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, well, just about the last theorem, uh, this factorized upper bound. When you say nearest neighbor, you mean nearest neighbor among the collection Z1 to Zn? Uh, yes. So it, uh, so it would so for uh, it would be minimum over J different from I. Of this means the I and ZJ. And um, you have, you have a fix, a pick, throw some points uh, in, uh, and fit, so you have a collection of, uh, of points and. One of these points, you just look who's the closest to you. But what happens if the two fields are uh, not the same? Like one is a phi and the other is the square of a phi. Yeah, then the power changes, right? So, yeah. so you are one of those points, and that's where phi or phi squared is, is being evaluated. So the, you, you have a location and you also have a choice of, yeah, I'm a phi or I'm a phi squared. So that so, means that you have. A scaling dimension, which is uh, so what you so you look at the distance to your nearest neighbor, uh, and you raise that to your scaling dimension, not the scaling dimension of the neighbor. Maybe that's uh, yes, that's what I was asking. Right. Yeah, and then you take the product of this over all. Uh, 
Uh -huh. So you you will get them. You'll get each factor twice because you will you will take the product. Uh, yeah, for example, for the for the two point function of the phi, yes, you get. I mean, uh, there is only two guys, so basically splitting the the one over distance to the two times the scaling dimension, you're splitting it equally between the two the two people. Okay, and uh, the other. The other question I had is that you imposed the condition that P be a prime number for aesthetic reasons. Has it actually played any role in anything you discussed in this talk? No, really. I think it's just not confident. Since we did some of the computations we did, we used the Fourier analysis over the P addicts. I'm pretty sure it can be circumvented. So I don't. I think the result works for any uh, P, which is integer at least two. But uh, I wouldn't vouch for the other case. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty confident it worked. But uh, okay, since we, we took some shortcuts, and also we like to uh, relate this to uh, the p addicts because, okay, there is always the issue of uh, should I learn the p addicts to understand the hierarchical model? No, not really. But um, what the p addict setting is a particularly clean way of doing the hierarchical model approximation and uh, it gives you access to kind of a software library if you need a result one day just look at the, what the number theor theorists did and you probably will find it somewhere so uh, i mean there's also a hope of eventually uh, building a, um, a similar uh, uh, kind of CFT or whatever uh, over what is called the Adels, where you take where your underlying space is not just the reals or RN or RD. It's a, a product where you have the reals and all the piatic fields. Uh, this, I mean, there was some excitement about this in uh, string theory in particular with work of a uh, friend and Witten, I think early 90s or something like that, because they, they found that some formulas for uh, Veneziano amplitudes uh, can. Uh, you can compute the what it's worth for the reals by taking the product of uh, all the p-adic analogs. So, uh, mm -hmm. but that's very speculative. I had a question. Sorry. So I think we have two questions. Maybe Stefan goes first. Okay. Uh, sure. Uh, would this work? Are there any models with vector valued fields for the Pianics? Uh Yes, there are. Um, uh, is it is it possible to formulate gauge theories? Over the okay, so there, so yes, so um, uh, I mentioned this. Okay, uh, this literature. So since the Gupser, that was around, I mean, twenty sixteen. I, I think we were all. Uh, we were all at Oberwolfa at the conference, I think, uh, when um, I saw the uh, article on the Archie. I mean, so um, anyway, so the, since then, there's been lots of uh, literature uh, by Gupser himself and his students, also a group around Mathilde Marcoli. Um, and they are basically exploring, so Gupser, uh, unfortunately, he passed away, but um, uh, these younger folks, uh, PhD students and postdocs, um, they have been exploring this kind of question. So they, 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 they know how to work with the put in fermions for n component uh, scalar boson, that's no problem. Uh, it's trivial, <laughs> they can't copy. Uh, but um, the, they have the SYK model. Uh, they, I think they investigated what would be the analog of gauge theories, even gravity. So if you put gravity on the box, so the tree here, uh, I said the, the graph distance is you just have a length of the edges is one, but what if, for instance, the lengths of the edges are some random positive numbers that would be kind of the first uh, attempt at trying to define gravity in the dog. I think it's uh, it's a bit, it, it doesn't quite, I mean, it's a bit, uh, doesn't quite work, but there are smarter proposals. I think, uh, uh, I remember there's a guy called Bogdan Stoika, I think worked with Marcoli and, and uh, has written a paper with STL recently on uh, this type of uh, models, uh, proposals for maybe gravity, uh, quantum gravity on these things. So, uh, yeah, people have, have explored uh, already and there's more to explore. Okay. So, so the, okay. Go ahead. 
Yeah. So, so in the last slide, you um, uh, you wrote Kolmogorov Chensov. So I was wondering, you know, what are you getting? Did I was there? Uh, the Kolmogorov Chensov theorem. Where is Kolmogorov Chensov? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I the title of the uh, article. Uh, so yeah. So if you want to look it up, just yeah, second quantized Kolmogorov Chensov, and probably the only one who used this. Uh, so Google should, should give you uh, my article, but. Um, Yes, the article is about um, essentially uh, relating uh, the problem of taking squares of distribution with higher power I and mean, products of random distribution. So you regularize, uh, you take the product and then you remove the regularization. Do you get something? So that many people have been working on. Uh, and relating this probabilistic problem to the operator product expansion in uh, which is used as a fundamental tool in the conformal bootstrap, but more generally in, in quantum field theory. Uh, so um, uh, I have a theorem, a very general theorem, which essentially tells you you can actually construct products of random distributions, but the hypothesis of the theorem <laughs> is uh, the operator product expansion, which is quite, quite a horrible uh, uh, hypothesis, but OK. Um, in the simplest form, it has to do with estimates like this. I was wondering, you know, Kolmogorov Chensov means, you know, you get continuous modifications. So, so you are getting continuous modifications of something or? Uh, yeah, you know? but it's, this is second context. So what I would call the, I mean, the ordinary Kolmogorov Chensov, which tells you that uh, if you have some estimates on how the correlations blow up on the diagonal, you can say that uh, almost surely your sample fields have uh, holder regularity, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that's the usual uh, Kolmogorov Chensov. So for me, I call that the, uh, the, uh, I mean, first quantized Kolmogorov Chenso. So, what is the second quantized? Is a regularity statement. But uh, if you if you if you're familiar with Hida distributions or uh, I mean the white noise formalism that uh, I mean uh, Albeverio, I think other people work with. So, um, which is kind of an infinite dimensional analog of how you go from L two L two of R n, you go to uh, to uh, Schwarz distributions on Rn. Now take uh, L2 of some probability space or with your favorite, uh, you know, Wiener, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> Brownian motion, or whatever, um, and um, uh, trying so, so you can define products of random distributions. Uh, but typically, they would not be uh, new random distributions. They would not be new random variables. But you can define them as kind of so not really functions, but as generalized functions. So like, uh, uh, it's just the infinite dimensional analog of going from L2 to S prime. And I mean, for physicists, it's, it's quite simple. It means uh, that you, uh, that, uh, that what is an operator? Uh, physicists would say, well, it's something that you can stick in a correlation. <laughs> Actually, it's the same thing, but with a estimates and all. The, the test functional would be called uh, the spectator fields in the uh, uh, physics language about the uh, operator product expansion. Thank you. Maybe a little question with respect to your stability result in, uh, I think, one of the last, but not the very last transparency, you, where you said you can add these phi to the six and phi to the eight terms with small coefficients. Can you be mm -hmm. a bit more precise on what uh, what you can really do? Um, can you add also non polynomial? Um... So uh, so I have to be um, so uh, in terms of the the measure on the um, on the unit lags. So uh, you have a phi four. So the phi four this is the g and it has to be in an interval like that, so close to the approximate fixed point, uh, and then you can. Put so you, you choose a degree. Say I want to go up to uh, phi to the one hundred. Okay, it has to be uh, even. Uh, I mean, there is a stability condition, so you, you need the coupling for phi to the one hundred to be positive, and then the below uh, from phi six all the way up to. And you can put um, only even powers. So so the result is not with odd powers, but for even. So you put phi six, phi eight, uh, up to uh, phi one hundred. Uh, so up to phi uh, to power 98, um, they can be any sign you want, but they have to be small, sufficiently small. Uh, the the coefficient, the last one, phi to the 100, has to be small and positive. Uh, 
to have stability. But if you have that, then the same result holds. Um, the five small square, the, the five form the, is also hmm? small means combinatorial small, just a, a, a ten to the minus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two or something. yeah, 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 yeah. You can, I mean, you can even write it explicitly. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I mean, small, I think it's going to be some epsilon to the three halves also, uh, small kinds of combinatorial constant, which you can define as well. Uh, yeah, the result is you get, uh, uh, so the, um, uh, there was these uh, numbers here floating around, y2, y0. So these are kind of uh, just a recent uh, to be able to phrase it. Um, this is like fixing the, the second moment of a certain distance to be one, or, uh, like the central limit there. You want to say the second moment to be one, and that forces you to divide by the sigma as close to that. So um, up to these, uh, yeah, these numbers that have to be adjusted, which are just recentering. Re okay. uh, the measure, the joint measure of phi and the square is exactly the same. So it is a universality state. Thank you. Okay, are there any further questions? Maybe I have a little one. So in, in your, your mass parameter, does it matter what sign it has? Can you also do the negative mu case in your p uh, So here, the, the mass, so the, um, so the, um, okay, where is the, uh, yeah, so the, this is the big order. So in terms of just ordinary phi square and phi four, the, the mass is very, very negative. Okay. Uh, now in terms of the, you know, Hermit polynomials, so um, uh, I don't know, I think I can maybe track what is the, what is the, the critical mass uh, to order epsilon or something like that to see is it positive or negative, but yeah. So what, what is it, the, the critical mass? Is it positive or negative? So um, it depends you? what you call the critical mass. If it's the coefficient of the true phi squared, it's definitely negative. Okay. It's a uh, measure. Uh, but this is the core. So, I mean, this, uh, oh, right. actually it comes from here. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. First, so it includes a minus gr. Sure, yeah. Uh, uh, phi squared. Actually, I think we we, we mentioned it in the uh, in the paper and check that. So the yeah. So if you write this in terms of ordinary phi four and phi squared, it's double well. The the, the coefficient of phi squared is quite negative. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. So are there any further questions or remarks? Well. Apparently not. So Malik, thank you very much again for this nice talk and discussion. Uh, the next uh, seminar in this series will be on November 11th at 11 a.m. Eastern time. <laughs> and uh, we're very happy that Surav Chatterjee will speak, hopefully on his recent work on gauge theories, even though the title is not announced yet. So please join again in, uh, on, on November 11th. And until then, have a good time. See you. All right. See you, everyone. All right.